Good morning. God is good. All the time. God is good. Amen. Hey, CPC, we believe we are all the children of God, from the youngest to the oldest, and you can decide where you fit in that spectrum. Uh, but So we believe that we all are called to worship together, so we love when children are in worship with us. Uh, there is a nursery available today, is it? No, there's not. There's not a nursery, but it's available for parents to bring their kid from zero to three back there if they need to gather their kid back there for a moment. But we also been transitioning away from our worship table to we have these new things called worship bags. Thanks to Marianne. Woo! Activities. Yeah. All right. Activities to help engage kids in worship with you next to the pew. Uh, you can pick one up, and then after the service, you can put it back underneath where it says, please return. So we would encourage you to do that. And if you think you're a child and you need one of these, we're okay. We're not going to judge. We won't judge at all. So uh, we also pull out your cell phone. If you're new, we'd love to get to know you. And you can type, uh, text WELCOME to 299-2100. Or at any time during the service or any time after, if you want a prayer request, uh, and offer prayer, that you can text that prayer to 299-2100, and the elders and the prayer team will pray for you and reach out to you as well. God is calling us to worship him. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship this morning? <coughs> Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Worthy is a lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior, I, that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and tall Fixed on 
The church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.
be seated. so freely and generously provided for all of our needs and our giving is in response of thanks to him. One of the ways you can give is by placing your offering in the shade of the rear window. Almighty God, all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Take these gifts and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom and the glory of your name. Amen. Part of our caring for you is to pray for you, so I encourage you to text PRAY to 413-299-2100, and one of the elders of Pastor Tracy will be happy to pray with you and for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of mercies, we give you humble and heartfelt thanks for all your goodness and your loving kindness to us. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and for all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your precious love, for our redemption through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for the hope of glory. We pray that you would give us a sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be sincerely thankful, and that we may give you praise, not only with our lips, but in the way we live our lives, giving ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness in all our days. Holy Spirit, we pray that our city, state, national, and world governmental leaders would come to know you and accept you as Lord and Savior. Fill them with wisdom, understanding, discernment, and knowledge. Merciful Father, we confess that we seek fulfillment and satisfaction in the things of this world instead of trusting your promise that you, our God, will supply every need of ours according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Loving Father, we ask that you comfort the grieving, heal according to your will those who are in chronic pain, dealing with depression and anxiety. May they rest in the assurance that you care for them and that you are with them at all times. Lord, we pray that your spirit would empower families to be compassionate, kind, patient, and forgiving. We pray for Pastor Tracy and the leaders of this, your church. May they seek your wisdom and guidance in leading your people with grace and love. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. We had the honor and privilege this morning from hearing, Jessica, from, hearing from Jessica Parfumi from InterVarsity Springfield. And we're going to invite her up. InterVarsity Springfield is one of the, uh, greater Springfield, is one of the ones that we support, our missions that we support. And so we're going to bring Jessica up to present to us. And I know there's a couple of uh, volunteers with her as well. Uh, Jonathan and Brandon volunteers. Does, does, does Mary volunteer too? Okay, well, yeah, yeah, I started to pull you out. So, so, yeah. so, yeah. so I'm going to be not disrespecting the Bible here. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Very quickly. Yes. So my name is Jessica Bafumi. I'm the InterVarsity Greater Springfield Area Director. This Bobby, is... Where's that? <laughs> Yeah, there we go. And there are two volunteers with InterVarsity, so I um, wanted to bring them up and introduce them as well. Uh, I've been here ministering in the Greater Springfield for the last five years. Prior to that, I spent five years ministering in Vermont. I know I look like I could be a college student, yes, but no, I swear, like I've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, so the vision here in the Greater Springfield is to be a unified community seeking to love God and our neighbors, making his name known on college campuses and in our city. Um, so I'd love to just introduce you. So Jonathan wants to share a quick story of how he has seen this vision impact the students here in the Greater Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm a, as Jeff mentioned, I'm a volunteer for InterVarsity. Started back in the fall, and um, so I help out on something we call Core, which is a, um, what we, the time we take on Monday nights to uh, disciple the student leaders. And also recently, I started helping out at Westfield State with the student leader who's been running that Bible study. And just one of the really cool things that I've noticed is from just in that short period of time from the fall to now in April, watching the student leader who's um, running the Westfield Bible study, just watching like how quickly he's grown and really stepped up to the plate and like watching him lead these students and, and teaching them about Jesus on, on campus. Like 
how quickly that's happened, it's just like, it really puts that into perspective, just like pouring in the time and effort into these kids to, um, I say young adults, not kids, but to disciple them and like just help them out and then to see them grow like that is, is really incredible. So it's, uh, it's been awesome to be a part of it. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Yeah, so um, to give you a little bit of context, uh, we are reaching eight uh, campuses here in the greater Springfield area. And you may ask, like, why, why is this an important ministry? So uh, the Barna Group did minis- uh, a survey, uh, I think this was in 2016, and it, the study conducted shown that out of U.S. adults today, uh, 75% of Christian young people actually fall away from their faith and leave the church after high school. So we are reaching an essential population where, I mean, I'm sure you all are sitting here thinking about your youth group, your, your young people that are here that are under 18. Statistically, this is kind of what we're seeing across the country, that 75% will walk away. So we kind of come in, and you can go to the next slide, um, to reach students. Uh, that, that Sorry, that's the old slide, but that's one of the reasons why. But you can go to the next one. Um, next one, I'm so sorry about that. I, apparently, that's the old PowerPoint. Uh, these are the eight campuses that we are trying to kind of see that statistic reverse and reach students uh, here in the greater Springfield area. We've also launched uh, a large group that meets once a month on Monday nights where young adults who are 18 to 24, so if you're a young adult here in this area and you're looking for a community, uh, can come and meet community, hear a gospel message, and get an opportunity to respond. So the impact of this ministry has been that we have been able to uh, plant a gospel witness on eight of the campuses, so that's all eight that are here in the greater Springfield. We have been able to reach about 450 students that are currently involved across all the Bible studies and encounter. We have about 100 to 130 students that come every month to encounter. Uh, This past year alone, we saw 83 people come to know Jesus and follow him as Lord and Savior. That, give a round of applause for God, y'all. That's like probably the most exciting thing that we've gotten to see this past year. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, we, we mentor and disciple about 40 student leaders every single Monday that then go for the rest of the week to their campuses to plant Bible studies. We have hired on four part-time staff. I'm the one full-time area director. These are our four part-time staff. And then we have about 14 volunteers uh, across different churches in this area that are involved like Brandon and Jonathan and, and others. So if you want to hear more about what we're doing, you want to connect with us, we have a website. Uh, InterVarsityGreaterSpringfield.org that has all the information on there. So if you ever have a student that you're like, want to connect with a Bible study, the best way to connect them is online, as well as our Instagram page. If you want to know more, I'll be in the back at the end. We just have some contact cards where if you want to receive regular prayer updates, they go out about quarterly. We can get you on that list. Or if you just want to meet one-on-one and hear more about what we're doing and how to partner, how to connect, or you're interested in volunteering, there's a, there's a process of application for that. But we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to connect more. Or even if you just want to know what's going on and you have Instagram, follow the page. It's a lot of fun. Our creative team does a great job. So thank you so much for having me. I look forward to chatting with you all later. So, yeah, thank you. Father God, we just thank you for how you have moved Jessica, um, called her to ministry, and we thank you that she has responded faithfully to that call. We pray that you would um, continue to raise up leaders through her work, that you would continue to grow them, um, as Jonathan uh, attested to, about how you can grow them um, into faithful leaders. We pray for all the um, young college students who still do not know you. Our heart breaks for them, and we just ask that you would continue to work through the leaders and through the work that Jessica has done and is continuing to do. Um, And we pray for resources. We pray that the part-time staff could move to full-time staff and that you would just continue to grow your kingdom through this work. We just um, ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the king of love be the 
the king of my life be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, you are good, you are good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Our scripture today is Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Nahum chapter 1, 
and fruitful. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkai. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind of things, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains shake before, quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before before his indignation who can endure the heat of his anger his wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him the lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble he knows those who take refuge in him for with an overflowing flood flood he will make complete the end of his adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness what do you plot against the lord he will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, fully dry. For you can, one, who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they might still Though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. This is the word of the Lord. Mighty and almighty God, we thank you today for the message by your Holy Spirit that you have given Tracy to deliver us to us. Give us hearts that are open, God, to your word, minds that understand, Lord, and your will to do for this people who are here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, if you have uh, are willing to color, I would love to see a picture uh, of the sermon of what you hear after the service. I'd love to see that. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 1 through 3, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounced you will be judged, and with the measure you use will be measured to you. Jesus, in a few verses, explains his judicial system. You will be given the same treatment as you treat others. It's the golden principle. It's the golden rule that he explains a few verses down in Matthew 7. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Got it. We got it, right? It's easy, right? Treat others as I want to be treated. That's easy peasy. We got this. We can be done with the sermon and walk away. But we don't often think of this as Matthew 7 as a rebuke. We don't often think of it as a, a defense, uh, as an unfair criticism. Like, you can't judge me. That's what we want to hear it, right? So he's talking to you, not really me. Don't judge me. You don't have a right to judge me. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Because this is what we say, we all sin, so don't judge, right? We're all sinners, therefore we shouldn't judge. You don't get to judge my sin. But when we, when we do this with this verse, what we're doing is we're ignoring that sin has different consequences. That there's different severity of sin. That there's different kinds of sin. And we, we think all sin is the same sin, yet Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says there's greater sin. And here's, here's a difference between two different kinds of sin. There is unrepentant sin, and there is repentant sin. 
One is greater than the other. Unrepentant sin is much greater than repentant sin. And so when we, when we say, hey, you can't judge me, we ignore that there actually is differences and reasons why we actually might judge people. But this verse, judge not that you not be judged, it actually is a warning that should terrify us. It should shake us to our core. Because our sin nature, because our broken desires, we relentlessly compare and judge others and look for faults and blame in others. And so whether we outwardly judge them, we judge them. Do you think that God doesn't know that? God says the way you judge them, the way you judge them, I will judge you. And even, this is even more insidious, is that some of us, we actually judge ourselves in that same way. This inner self criticism, this relentless comparing ourselves to others. That's sin as well. God knows that you're judging yourself in that way. Jesus' justice system is, is this idea of you're given the same treatment as you treat God's beloved. You will be given the same treatment as you treat God's beloved. So far in our series of reaching the Ninevites, going through Jonah and Nahum, right, we've learned that understand that we are to understand ourselves as the Ninevites. We are the enemies of God in which God has redeemed. That God has reached out. And, and in Nahum, we were, were in the last couple of weeks that God introduced himself with his covenant name and his character, right? That he's slow to anger, but that he will bring justice. This is who God is. And in verses 2 through 8, there's this hymn of praise to God, this God who will bring justice, who will bring justice to those that afflicts his beloved, that turns his beloved's affections away from him, that God is jealous for his bride. We've also learned that rebellion against and rejecting God is the most serious sin. And Nahum's words in this hymn of praise were appointing to the incarnation, the death and resurrection, and the Jesus going down to the place of death, Sheol. In today's verses, verses 9 through 12, and the prophet Nahum passes judgment on various adversaries. He gets to the point. Here is who I'm judging. But he judges them without actually naming them explicitly in the text. And in our English, we have these pronouns that are in the text. Except these pronouns are too vague in the English. You see, pronouns are important. I'm not going to go on a whole thing about pronouns right now. But the pronouns are important here because in verses 9, what do you plot against the Lord? Who's the who? Who is the who? Who is the you? Here it is. In verse 9, what do you, you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second time. There's three strong and short statements. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end, and he will not, the Lord will not let trouble rise up again. The you here is a masculine plural. See, in English, a you can be singular or plural. And in the Hebrew, it's actually not a pronoun at all. It's just modifying a verb. Here's what we know in the context. This you, which is a masculine plural, and later there's going to be a you that's not a masculine plural. The you here is actually the Assyrians, because we know the context that Nahum is preaching against the Assyrians. And each one of these statements is about a past action the Assyrians did to God's people. Remember the context that Nahum wrote this book in 639 B.C. That's 150 years after the prophet Jonah, where in the prophet Jonah, right, the Ninevites, the capital city of the Assyrians, they repented right away. The enemies of God's people repented right away to Jonah's message. And for 
and this is exactly what we told in Jonah, that Jonah actually was upset with God because he knew that the enemies of God people would repent, and if they did repent, that would mean the end of God's people, that they would rise up and wipe them out. And Jonah was right. That's exactly what the Assyrians did. And for a hundred years, the Assyrians ruled with superior might in this region against all their neighbors, uncontested with their physical power. Other nations became vassal states where they were forced to give oaths to the king of Assyria to pay tributes or face their wrath. Numerous non-biblical accounts tell us of the history and the wicked and violent plots that the Assyrians did to Israel and to their neighbors any time they opposed them, any time they refused to pay tribute. In fact, we have a biblical account in 2 Kings 17, 1 through 6. In the 12th year of, of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, son of Elah, began to reign in Samaria over Israel, that's the northern kingdom, and he reigned nine years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So God's king of Israel, his people, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, which is a pattern, yet not as the king of Israel were before him. Against him came up Shalmanes, king of Assyria, and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute. So they bowed down to Assyria. But the king of Israel found treachery in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to so king of Egypt, that's south, and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria. So Israel paid no tribute. They held back for a moment, and they didn't pay tribute to Assyria, but they went down and reached out to Egypt. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three, three years besieged it. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halal, and on that harbor, the river goes on, and the cities of Medes. What did the Assyrians do? The Israelites refused to pay tribute. They were paying tribute, then they held back. King of Assyria found out. What did he do? Wiped them out. How dare they? How dare they not give us honor and glory? Wipes them out, carries them away. Assyria had no tolerance or patience for Israel's scheming and betrayal of their forced oath. Remember God's judgment? He judges us with the measure we judge others. You see, initially, when they heard Jonah's message, the Assyrians repented. They accept God's blessing. God expanded their empire, brought them wealth and fame and power. And you know what they did? They turned back and refused to acknowledge God and all his provisions. Jesus has a parable about this too. In Matthew 21, 33 through 41. Here another parable, Jesus said. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, who put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenants. And he went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And his tenants took his servants and beat him, killed one another, stoned another. And he sent his other servants more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let his kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to the other tenants who will give them the fruits in their season. When we hear this parable, when the Pharisees heard this parable, it becomes easy to understand the parable. He said, oh, we're going to judge the wicked tenants. They're terrible. This is obviously, it's not their land. It's not their provision. And they're killing the kings, the owner of this, and they're killing all of them. They're not giving him the fruits of their blessing. They're trying to seize the land, and we, be, we judge them. It's easy. But that's not the point of this parable. The point of this parable is that you and I easily 
judge the wicked tenants for stealing what was not theirs. That's what Jesus is doing to the Pharisees. And that's what he's doing for us. Because Jesus says, look at all of creation is mine. You are all stewards in a leased creation. Everything belongs to me. And all of us steal his glory. Worse than that, we fail to acknowledge him. Worse than that, we don't even give him thanks. That's the point of this parable. See, in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. God created everything. God created you. All of your material blessings, whatever, however small you think they are, is because God has given them. God has, God has the grace to give them. And here's what I'm going to say. Us in this room, no matter the different variants of provisions that we have, have 99% of the world more than the world does. 99% more than the rest of the world that you and I have in this room. More provisions. And yet, how often do we think we're responsible? That we accumulate these. This is our effort. Isaiah records the king of Assyria's response. Isaiah 10, 13, this is what the king of Assyria says. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of people and I plunder their treasures like a bull. I bring down those who sit on thrones. This king of Assyria says, I did it. It's by my will, my might, my intellect, my wisdom, my strength. I accomplished all these things, this great empire. You're not like the king of Assyria, are you? In your life where you have these accomplishments, look what I did. Maybe you don't say it, but you think it, don't you? Look how good I've done. Look at all my effort. Or maybe we think, if I just strive a little bit harder. You see, God gives because he loves. This is who God is, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gives. Because he loves, he gives. He freely gives because that's who he is, and he loves his people. But God desires gratitude and praise in, retu in return. God even grants us time to repent, to give him praise and gratitude. Second Peter 3.19 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The Syrians have condemned themselves using God's justice in the way they have judged others. They judged Israel really quickly. How dare you not pay tribute to us? Look at what we've done for you. And God's, oh, that's the way you're going to judge? That's the way he's going to judge the Assyrians. God has granted over a hundred plus years for the Assyrians to repent again. The Assyrians repented. Then they turned back and did their own thing. And God lasted these hundred years for the Assyrians to actually repent and turn back. And here's what I mean by repentance. Like repentance is really turning away. You're going in the wrong direction, but oftentimes we think we just need to apologize. That's what repentance is. That's not what repentance is. I, how many times, right, well, this, my, my kids will often say, I have said, where it's like you've done something wrong and you say I'm sorry. It's like, that's great. That's a good first step. But I actually now I don't want you to do that thing anymore. And when you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, and you keep saying you're sorry, you're really not sorry. And so what God actually wants is fruits of your life to change. He wants the first steps. Give him thanks. I mean, just think about that as the first step of repentance. Give him thanks and give him the glory in which he deserves. First of all, the thanks for the opportunity to repent. 
and the time and patience to allow us. Eventually, God brings his justice. That is essential to God's justice. He will bring his justice. In Nahum 1.9, what do you, the Assyrians, plot against the Lord? It's almost like it's a comical thing. What could you plot against me? What power and might do you have against the almighty God? And his God says, I will make a complete end. And you will not rise up a second time. The, the irony here is the, is the Assyrians had a cruelty that had put a complete end to their enemies. When their enemies betrayed them, they would wipe them out. God just holds the Assyrians to their own standard. That's how you judge. That's how I'm going to judge you. They forgot that actually they didn't understand that the Assyrians, God actually rose up. This was his plan to bring them to discipline his people for their disobedience. The Assyrians thought it was their might and their power that expanded their kingdom. Assyrians broke their covenant treaty obligations to God because they refused to give him thanks and they refused to give him praise alone. And so when we hear and read Matthew 7, judge not that you not be judged by the measure that you use, but there will be measure used against you. It shouldn't encourage our vengeance or actions against us, but it actually should encourage us to move us to be a people of repentance and should move us to actually fear God. Because this is the God that will use the measure in which you use to judge others, to judge you. Gregory Crook, the commentator, says, No one exercises tolerance. We are all legalists. We all have absolute standards for others' behavior. When they offend these rules, we judge them severely. Only the gospel can liberate us from this legalism. It does, it does this by the fear of God. You see, the same God that says, judge not that you be judged, says in Matthew 18. And his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Did you hear that? I think you need to hear it again. Because I think we gloss over this really quickly. The same God that says, judge not that you be judged, says, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart, you will have to pay for all your debt. You see, what, what does God actually do? God is the one that goes to the cross. This is what Jesus does. He see, pays all your debt. It's free. It's just his grace to you. He takes upon all your sin, all the penalty for your sin, which is death, and he takes it upon himself. This is how he judges. He doesn't hold it against you. Yet in this grace, this grace demands a response. It demands a response of grace in us. And if we are people that are not going to freely forgive and freely have grace like him, like, well, then I'm going to use the measure which you decide. It's not how I judge it, but it's how you judge. That's the measure in which I will use. It shouldn't, this judge not used to be judged, should not encourage us to vengeance. It should encourage us to forgiveness and grace with people. And fear the God that brings justice. The gospel truth is this. Everyone sins. And this is the great equalizer in the whole world. This is what makes us all on footing with everyone. Because everyone sins. Everyone. And so you, you want to know why we all share a same dignity? It's because we all share the same brokenness. This is why we should treat everyone with the same dignity and equality with each other because we're all broken people. 
I tell this when people come in and share their broken with me. I try to encourage them. Listen, listen, your brokenness will not make me think less of you, but it'll actually make me understand my sin more and make me love you more because then I know you more. Not everyone always believes that. But I work really hard at it because of verses like this. The motivation and power to show kindness and grace comes from knowing God will bring vengeance and justice. The motivation and ability to forgive comes from God's demand that we forgive, lest we not be forgiven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's also the beginning of forgiveness. And we talked about uh, two weeks ago, like fear, like oftentimes we water down this idea of, in Scripture, fear, that fear is this, uh, this awe and worship. And yes, it is, but it is also clearly a trembling before the mighty power of God. That's what it is. And yet, this is this kind of weird paradox in which Jesus says, I am the only one you ought to fear, and yet do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of me. Nahum 1.10. For they're all entangled. They, the Assyrians, are entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They're consumed like stubble, fully dried. Verse 9 gives us the reason for God's judgment, stealing God's glory. Verse 10 gives us the method of execution with three similes. Like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink, like stubbled, fully dry, right? The, the entangled thorns take over the fields. They're worthless. They make the field worthless. The drunkards incapacitate themselves by their drink. Uh, stubbled, fully dry, burns after separating from the root of the vine, and it, it is worthless. It's the chaff. It's, what God is saying is, I totally will incapacitate the Assyrians. I will make them useless. Psalm 1, 3 through 4, this great psalm, says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, chaff like that wind dries up. They're pointless. They're worthless. They, there's no point to it. Jesus says this, uh, similar to Psalm 1 and John 15, 5 to 6. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I in them, he is that it will bear much fruit. You are this tree planted by this water. You will bear fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown to the fire and burned. Totally incapacitated, worthless, pointless, pointless. When we are connected, united with Christ to the, to the word that nourishes us and feeds us and grows us, it, it makes us strong, it produces fruit. In, God produces fruit in our lives, produces grace and forgiveness, kindness, patience. When we are independent, autonomous of God, we are worthless, withered up, drunk and blown away and eventually burned up. That's the metaphor in which scripture is saying. And here's the thing. Many of us, day in and day out, even though we know Jesus, walk autonomously. Why would you choose that? Why would we choose it? Because we're sinners. But if you really understand that when you choose this path, you are worthless. You produce nothing. It's insignificant. Only when you are connected and united with Christ will you produce a fruit worth feeding on. So the who of the you in verse ten, 9 and 10 is the Assyrians. But then we never have another you in verse 11. And the gender and the, and the plural change the singular. Nahum 1.11. Who is the you? From you came one who plotted evil against the Lord. 
a worthless counselor. Now, if you're just reading in English, you're just thinking he's talking about the same you, right? It's actually a feminine singular. So here's two possibilities in the context. The events of 11 uh, happened in 701 BC. The Assyrians sent a human messenger to Jerusalem to give worthless counsel in 2 Kings 18, 30, 31. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree and each one of your own will drink the water of his own cistern. So here's what the messenger of the king of Assyria comes to preach to the people of Judah. He says, do not listen to your king. Do not trust in your God. Trust in the king of Assyria. This is his advice. Trust. I, king of Assyria, was the one that's going to provide you all that you need. Do not trust in God. So this you, a feminine, could be this worthless messenger that happened. 70 years before Nahum writes. And so now this is the judgment against this messenger of the king of Assyria. But here's the other thing about this. This word worthless could actually be a proper name. This worthless, in, in, this, in verse 11, this worthless counselor could be a proper name, Bela. Bela, a personified worthlessness. And you know where else we hear this? name is in 2 Corinthians 6.15. What accord has Christ with Belal? On what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? You see, the church fathers connected Belal to a name for Satan. Or regardless, in this context, an evil spirit, one that turns people away, that turns the God's beloved affections away from God, and we already know how God feels about that. He is a jealous God for his people, and his judgment is those that turn away his affections of his people from him. So this worthless counselor, this evil spirit, came from you, feminine singular, because the worthless spirit comes from the you, who is a feminine singular. And so this evil spirit has to come from another spirit. And we know that the God of the Assyrians is a feminine God named Ishtar. So maybe it is a human, the human messenger, that is referring to in a name. Name doesn't be clarified. Or maybe, and I think this is probably, it's probably both. God is not just, it's the, the, the Ishtar, this feminine God this false god of the Assyrians. God is not just taking vengeance on the Assyrians. He's also taking vengeance on their false religion, going after their false gods. This is a god who wipes out and uses the judgment that you use to judge others, just like the Assyrians did. And then Nahum 1.12, thus says the Lord, Though they are at full strength and many, they will be cut down and passed away. Though I have looked at you, the you here, different text, is actually God's people. Because this is who this book is written to. Though I have afflicted you, God's people, I will afflict you no more. And that's what the book of Nahum is about. Is God coming after those that are hurting God's people. You see, God promises uh, we're in this in 639 B.C. This is when this book is written. And this word full strength here is actually the word shalom, peace. And which is interesting, in the history of the record books of the Assyrians themselves, which because the Assyrians had this great library, and so we actually have access to this li library. They actually said from 639 was the beginning of 12 years in which no history and no wars were recorded, which is the only time in their history in which nothing was recorded and no wars. They had peace. No one rose up against them for 12 years. When God says, in this peace, when you're at full strength, that's when I'll cut you down. That's why I'll put an end. When you think you're invincible, God will prove you otherwise. 
and then 12 years later, that's when the Babylonians start to invade Assyria, and eventually they wipe them out. God's justice system, judge not, lest you be judged. For the measure used would be used against you. It's not, dis- it's not meant to dissuade us from judging sin or confronting sin. Jesus always confronts sin. Jesus always, he, does, he never ignores sin. He always confronts sin. So this message is not say, hey, just ignore sin around you. Let your friends sin. It's okay. That's not what this passage is saying. It's said so we actually learn to trust and fear God alone. To judge our own sin, first and foremost. This is the the, the plank in our eye, we judge first. So when we hear this passage, judge not unless you be judged, with that measure, we will be measured against us. It's meant for us to turn inwardly and to begin to judge ourselves. Begin to evaluate who we really are. You see, God raised up the Assyrians. He equipped them for a purpose to discipline his people, the Israelites, the Judahites, who had turned away from God. The Assyrians, even though they were raised up by God, rebelled and turned against God as quickly as they turned to him. They trust in their own ability and their own strength, ignoring the constant presence and grace-filled provisions of God. And we know God is gracious. And we know he is slow to anger. And we know he's abounding in steadfast love. But we know he's a God of vengeance. Because he's a God of justice. He has to. He has to bring justice. If God doesn't bring justice, then this world and this universe is not fair. John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the Assyrians thought they were doing something. But in reality, they were doing nothing. Nothing they did bared any fruit because they were apart from God. You and I do nothing when we are not united with Jesus. This is the, assess- the lesson that Assyrians learned. They became like chaff in the wind, easily blown away. When we choose other sources of strength and provision other than God and his word, we will inevitably find the folly of that choice and learn that it is worthless and nothing in comparison to the eternity and reality of God. Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and then they hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Instead of actually believing that God will provide them the water, that God will provide them the cisterns, that God would do the work, they said, not you, I've got a thing to do, and I'm going to provide myself. Those are the two great evils in which God uses Jeremiah to judge his people. May we be a people that take God seriously. May we be a people to understand that fear is not just awe and worship, but trembling at his power, a power that provides us everything that we need, more than we need, a power that holds everything together, the power that gives us every breath that we take, every provision that we have. May we be a people that examine our lives right now, not ignoring our sin, but confessing our sin to God and repenting. Repenting. Repenting that we forget to acknowledge him and we go our own way and we think we're providing for ourselves and for others. And let's start with this idea of repentance. You want to start with repenting in your life? You want to start turning back? It's not just saying confessing your sin. It's actually beginning to say, 
thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment that I can repent and giving him praise. Acknowledging that everything is from him. Everything. May we be a people that repent and give him the glory alone. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, I confess that I often go throughout the day without acknowledging you, with thinking of all the ways that I need to accomplish the things that uh, is before me and all the power that I need to, to, to trust in me. And I, and I know day in and day after, uh, day after, I get frustrated because of my incompetence. Lord, help me and help us to not be frustrated with our incompetence, but to praise and glory for your competence, for your grace. And help us to be aware of your presence and your provision each and every moment of our lives. Help us to live as people of grace and forgiveness, much as you have given us this grace and forgiveness. Give us that a power and ability and desire to forgive, to be patient, to be kind, to be self-controlled in this world which seems out of control. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for this day and for the next and for all eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. standing and join me in affirming our faith as written in the Nicene Creed. 
we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, in the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You may be seated. We welcome all baptized Christians who profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, sincerely repent of their sins, and are members of a gospel ter uh, proclaiming church universal to receive this sacrament with us today. This table is a symbol and remembrance of how God judges, how God judges us. God judges us by going to the cross, by taking our penalty upon himself and freely giving his grace and forgiveness and his righteousness to us. This is how God judges us. This is how he loves us. And he invites us to this table to proclaim our faith and to receive, to receive growth and strength in that proclamation. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading by our own transparent confession. Would you please take a moment to silently confess your sins to God? Brothers and sisters, Scripture says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also came through a human being. For us all die in Adam, so we will also be made alive in Christ. Know that you are forgiven. Amen. We respond to God's forgiveness by living our thanks according to God's word. Hear now God's will for your lives. 
You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Let us pray. With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth, made us in your image, kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is coming open to us the way of salvation and whose triumphant return we eagerly await. Therefore, we join our voices with all the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent him into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior, to bring freedom to the captives of sin, and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home, where we will sit at table with Christ our host. Therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this gift of this bread and this cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Allow your Holy Spirit, make us one with Jesus that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lord, fulfill us, fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory. All glory and honor are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to have the elders come forward and they're going to pass the plates. We're going to take communion in our pews. What I would encourage you as you pass the plate, don't just pass the plate. Serve the plate. Pa serve it and say, the body of Christ broken for you to your neighbor. If you know their name, say their name. If you blank out, just pass the plate. <laughs> uh, but here's what we believe. This this is bread and this is juice, but we believe Jesus is uniquely present through his spirit. And this is a spiritual feeding for us as well. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The servant elders come forward. Thank you. 
body of Christ broken for us. In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, drink of it, all of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the remission of sins. In the same way as he passed the cup, passed the bread, passed the cup and save your neighbor as they receive it. The blood of Jesus shed for you.
Love of Christ shed for us. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament you have given us your Son, who is the true bread of heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your works that our daily living may show repentance, thanks, forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A couple things uh, I want you uh, to know about. Uh, first of all, this is our first Sunday, so uh, return these back to the basket underneath. If you have uh, used these, that'd be awesome. Uh, and give Mary Dan a thanks for those, by the way. Uh, not right now, like when, later. Come on. Uh, join us for fellowship afterwards. So we'll have food and fellowship. Hey, talk to Jessica. Uh, she'll be in the back at the table with lots of information. Hey, sign up, get more information, pray, whatever. If you're interested in uh, volunteering, all those things, talk to Jessica afterwards. Um, we also, I just want to let you know, this is a, uh, we also have a new AEDD device in the back of the sink, uh, the fellowship room. Hopefully you never have to use it, and we never have to use it, uh, but it's one of those things that is straightforward. If we do have to use it, uh, it tells you how to use it. Uh, you don't have to be trained on it. So, uh, And it's for children as well. There's a child button, and it also has a Spanish button, so it can lead you in Spanish instructions as well. You're welcome, Reyna, <laughs> uh, on, those, um, on that. Uh, men's night tonight. Men's night tonight, 6.30. Uh, here, uh, Meatball Subs is on the menu. Uh, Charlie is giving his testimony. Uh, so I encourage you to come, men, uh, tonight. And women meet tomorrow, I think, heard? Is that correct? Tomorrow. Yeah, I'm looking like Jody. Yeah, you're there, right, Jody? <laughs> women meet tomorrow at 6 o'clock uh, for Heard. Great to have you out there. And then next Sunday night, next Sunday, sir, next Sunday night, we have a multi-church Sunday worship evening worship at Pioneer Baptist Valley Baptist Chapel in Chickabee at 6 p.m. Uh, I will be preaching uh, that night. I will be preaching and giving my testimony that night why I preach. Uh, come and uh, enjoy in that multi-church fellowship with the body of Christ together. Would you please stand and receive the benediction? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, go forth from this place knowing the grace of and the mercy in which God forgives you. That God grants you the power of his Holy Spirit for you to live a life of grace and mercy with others. Share Jesus with the world in those actions. Amen. Amen.